I want to talk to you this morning, if you can tell. <laughs> I've preached several years on warfare, and if you notice on the, in the last probably nine months or so, I've, I've really kind of steered away from that, and, and the only time I even mention uh, y'all's favorite person, um, Jezebel, I only do it in jest, and the Lord has been steering me back that way for several weeks, and I have resisted. <laughs> I've been kind of like the rudder on a boat, you know, that's kind of stuck. Like, no, God, no, God. <laughs> you ever seen those cars going down the road? It's been hit and the frame's bent. So the car is like this way, but they're moving this way. That's kind of the way I've been. I'm like, oh, I don't want to go back in that. So I'll just tell you how I got here. First off, let me give you a word that's been coming up in, in several conversations. Finally, I looked at my mother. I said, I really like this word, enrage. It means to make angry, it means to be put into a rage, it means to infuriate, but it also means to provoke. So I've been watching this stuff with, you can watch in, in the news, you can watch in, in the, uh, the way, the aggression, the animosity, the, the friction, the way people talk. Every time uh, you see something, there's, there's so much rage that is happening, but right now the enemy is enraged. I think the Lord is enraged too. You can see, I'll give you a couple of verses. I'm not going to read them. Uh, you can go back and read these later, but this is uh, where this word occurs in Scripture. It is Deuteronomy 4, 25, 9, 18, and 32, 21. All of these, that's 32, 21, 9, 18, and 4, 25. All of these verses are where the Lord was enraged at his people for idolatry. And then judgment would come. But I think right now there is a, uh, uh, a, a two-way enragement where God is enraged over the, the fact that a covenant nation, now we need to understand two things. We need to understand that Israel is the apple of God's eye, right? Clearly stated in, in, in Scripture. But we also need to understand through modern history that the only other nation that God has true covenant with is America. This is why the, uh, the terrorists and the, the hatred around the world calls uh, 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 America the, the big Satan and Israel the little Satan. It's this, it's this idea that these two are connected because we are. We're the only two nations in the world with a covenant relationship with, to God. Now, other nations may be Christian in, in some of their leadership, but the only nations who have an actual covenant with God are America and Israel. So when you look and you say, but God, why, why would you judge Israel? This is in the Old Testament. Why would you judge Israel the way that you judge her, but not the other nations when they're more evil than what Israel was? And it's very simple. It's because God didn't have covenant with those other nations. He had covenant with Israel. Now look at it this way. If you come over to my house and my child is doing something that you don't approve of and you go to spank my child, guess what? You're going to have a broken arm. I will pray for you afterwards. I will bless you. <laughs> but you touch my child and I'm going to hurt you. If I touch your child, you're going to hurt me. Right? Oh, y'all try to get all religious. Oh, I would never do that. <laughs> I've been to the football games. I've been to the softball games. I've been to the basketball games. And the scripture that says, Hell hath no fury like a woman scorned, understood the power of a mother. If y'all been there, y'all know it. I've seen mama come flying out of it. Not my mother, not my wife, but I've seen mama, almost my wife. <laughs> this is not a day of repentance, so I'm not going to tell on her. <laughs> but it's not a day of hiding the truth either, so I'm not going to lie for her. <laughs> it's that Arkansas side, I agree. I've told her that. We'll be at a game, and I, and I have to tell her, you know, look. Keep the Arkansas calm today. <laughs> I was going somewhere with all that. Y'all got me sidetracked. <laughs> no, you don't discipline my kids. I don't discipline your kids. Right? I don't talk bad about your family. You don't talk bad about my family. Have you ever seen that where somebody can, they can, you know, two brothers? Me and Mark. Me and Mark could be arguing because we never really fought. 
<laughs> that I would admit to. So we would, we would argue and we would be in a disagreement and, and we may not even want to speak to one another, but you let one person say something ugly to me. It was one day Mark wanted me to go fishing. I was little and I, and I didn't want to go because I was going to hang out with my friends. Well, what hanging out with my friends meant was building a clubhouse in the woods. And I was about 10 years old, 11 years old, something like that. So we go out and we build a clubhouse. And then some bigger kids in the neighborhood came over and tore down our clubhouse. Well, I go home. I'm very mad. I look at Mark and I said, so-and-so, which is a very big guy, tore down my clubhouse. And he said, What? <laughs> Now, we were not in agreement at the moment because he was mad that I didn't go fishing with him. But guess what? He was in agreement that nobody could be mad at me but him. So we went down to visit the other gentleman. And the gentleman was sitting on a five-gallon bucket. And he had a stick with, a, with some tape around it. And he was drawing in the dirt. So Mark looked at him and said, y'all are going to go back and put everything you tore down up. No, we ain't. <laughs> Mark kicked the stick out of his hand. It went flying and he bowed up at him and he put his finger in his face. He said, yes, you are. And you're going to do it now. And I was like, because this guy's bigger than Mark. <laughs> He's got that prophet anointing. He don't care. It's called little man syndrome. You just don't care. <laughs> there is a lot of bark in that dog, but there's a lot of fight in that dog, too conclusion of the story we got our clubhouse back within uh within two hours but <laughs> and an apology believe it or not my point is very simple god chastises those he loves that's what hebrews 12 tells us so he has covenant relationship with Israel and he has covenant relationship with America, which means that when America or Israel, they step out of alignment with the Lord, he is enraged over the sin that we allow. Right now, we are a nation that has not only allowed, but actually advocated for the murder of 60 million babies nearing. Guess what? God doesn't turn a blind eye to that. Guess who's at fault? The church. Because the church didn't stop it. We can blame liberals all day long. We can, we can blame uh, the world. But the world is going to be the world. We should expect the world to be the world. Now, we need to try to change the world. Impact the world. But we can't put the blame off on them because the church was sitting by saying, well, I don't think we should be involved in politics. We need to be involved in politics. We need our young people being raised up with the idea that I have a purpose in this world. I have a purpose in this life and it's bigger than just some, some little uh, uh, thing right here or to stay focused on my four walls in my church. We can worship and we can talk and we can do all this in my church, but I don't want to talk it outside of the four walls. We need to raise a generation that's not afraid to talk about it. We were, we were at the football game the other night, and two people shared a dream with me in the last week, and I couldn't remember who they were nor what the dreams were. I just remember somebody sharing a dream, and I remember it was important. So Charlotte and Heathworth, the game, I sit down with Charlotte, and I said, hey, was that you that had that dream and told me? And she looked at me like a deer caught in the headlights and said, um, no. I said, really? It was a dream, and I don't remember anything about it, but it was, it was, it, it, it was, it, it was. <laughs> whatever that means. And I just keep on, I'm hammering her, and I'm hammering, and, and then the, the, the lady behind us, I was trying to whisper, because I was trying, you know, not to let everybody know that I'm crazy, and this lady behind us, when I got up, she was looking at me going, <laughs> and then when, when I came back a little while later, she started grinning, and, and kind of turned her ear this way, she was really curious at what I was going to say next, so, anyway, I should get to my notes. Where something is, something is stirring in the spirit, amen? So let me, let me read something to you because I'm not sure what I said. Isn't that smart? But the enemy is enraged right now. The same spirit that drove Cain to kill Abel, the same spirit that drove the people of Sodom and Gomorrah in their vile lifestyles, uh, lifestyles and to try to take the angels that God sent, the same spirit that drove Goliath to torment the troops of Israel, the same spirit that drove Jezebel and is the same spirit behind the KKK, behind Black Lives Matter, behind all of the hate groups that we see in America, and it's also behind the political, social, and media realms that where you see the fighting and the, the hatred. I'm not talking about disagreeing. We can disagree. Right? My favorite meal is a medium rare steak. 
ribeye. That's not going to be everybody's favorite meal. Now, if you want to find disagreement, we can all go to eat together and then try to pick where to eat. And guess what? We are going to have a lot of disagreement. I know that because in my family alone, it is like negotiating a new constitution just to get a meal. I try to eat healthy. You know who else in my house eats healthy? We in church. She called me on her way home the other day. She said, what do you want for dinner? And I said, I don't know. Let's, let's, let's think this out because I'm thinking something grilled, something baked. She said, what about tacos? She don't drain the grease from her tacos. <laughs> Y'all see why I was feeling bad all them years. <laughs> A year and a half ago, my blood pressure stayed at pre-hypertension. Now that I feed myself, it stays really low. <laughs> anyway, I am moving on. I don't know who said that, but yeah, I agree. You would too. We can disagree without being enraged to each other. There is a spirit at work. It is the same spirit from the very beginning. It's the same spirit that, that drove Cain against Abel. It's an antichrist spirit that has been working through the earth and it's still working today. So let me give you a couple things and I want to get on the prophetic because I want to share with you some things that's been taking place. I want to share with you where we are and what's about to happen. So let me start with giving you a prophetic word from Chuck Pierce. I read this last week, but I want to re read it again. I may not read the whole thing. And I'll tell you, the Lord has kind of politely spanked me. <laughs> because a lot of the prophetic people, they're weird. And I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not normal, but I'm in that range, normal range. <laughs> And so watching some of them, I'm like, I don't know. Can you really hear from God if you were wearing a hot pink flowered Hawaiian shirt? I don't know. Well, apparently he can. So this is a, a word that was spoken July the 20th. My point to that is be careful what you discount. He says, the Spirit of God is starting to bring down revelation on top of us, and it's very important that we grab hold of this. This is why we are gathered tonight. I told Dutch, when we walked in, God is saying something, but I'm having a hard time grabbing it. But when you got us to that place and worship, all of a sudden I could see the word that was written across Florida. Now, again, this is July the 20th of this year. And the Lord said that the word for this state is surge. He said, watch the signs that are coming. There will be surges on both sides of the state. And I say... That will be a sign because the enemy is trying to find a narrow way into this state to infect the entire nation. But I brought you together tonight to create a surge in the atmosphere. And I say the surge will be like a light that shines down. And when the enemy comes in by night trying to enter and move up into the air, trying to create a strategy, he will be exposed. And you will hear of him being exposed throughout this nation. And I said to Tallahassee, I'm going to skip that, that part, but here's, here's what he says. There's going to be a surge on both sides of the coast of Florida. July 20th, six weeks before a hurricane that came and brought surges on both sides of the coast of Florida. Now, what he thought that meant and what I took that or would have taken that at uh, uh, prior to the hurricane would have been a spiritual surge on both sides, like revival coming up both sides of the coast of Florida, right? But in reality, what we saw is a hurricane that brought surges of water. Now, I believe two things. I believe that right now we are in a time that the prophetic and the natural are paralleling one another. Right? So if you see a surge of something in the natural, you will also see a surge in the spiritual. If you see uh, the, the, the prophetic word, when you hear something, and this is kind of where I want to move into, because I want to be very careful on how I state what I state today, because I don't want you to, to take it wrong. <laughs> 
The word I have today is prepare for war. But I don't want you to think that I'm declaring a natural war. At the same time, I'm not denying the possibility and probability that we may be at a natural war very soon. So I want to walk a very thin line in this. 1 Corinthians 13, 12 says, For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we see face to face. We know in part and we share in part. So here's what happens is, is, is literally when we receive a prophetic understanding from the Lord, a prophetic word, a dream, a vision, whatever it is, whenever God truly gives us something like that, it is something in part. It is not the whole thing. Right? So we have to take what the Lord gives us, try to understand it, but not make more out of it than what is there or not try to interpret more than is there. So the other night, and of course, I, I pray all the time for, for dreams. I've done that for years. and The Lord has spoken to me continuously or, or consistently in dreams. I've been praying more about that over the past month or so. And over the last two weeks, I've had a heavy feeling. Not a spirit of heaviness, but a heavy feeling. Particularly uh, in, in times that I'm, I'm uh, the times of the day that I usually kind of wind down and, and study or pray or listen to something. Those are the times that this heavy feeling uh, begins to settle on me. And it's a very serious, a very solemn feel. And the other night I'm, I'm coming home from the gym and I said, Lord, I don't like what I feel. Show me what I'm feeling. Show me what this is. I don't like what I'm feeling in the spirit right now. I feel heavy. Now, there's a difference between heavy and heaviness. Heaviness is something the enemy does to bring a spirit of heaviness on you and oppression. This is not that. This is something very serious. So Wednesday night, I have a dream. And... When I got up Thursday morning, I was still kind of stuck in that dream. Like walking, the, I don't ever do that. I was kind of stuck in this stupor of the dream, and I'm standing in the mirror, I'm brushing my teeth, and I'm I'm asking me questions about the dream. Like, what could this mean? Is this real? Surely that's not a prophetic dream. <laughs> so, I decided that it was just a goofy dream. And the whole way to church, I can't stop thinking about this goofy dream. So I get out here and I have a notebook that I write uh, uh, things down that I feel like the Lord has given me. And I'm like, I better write that down while I still remember the details. And, and uh, the phone kept ringing and so forth. So it took me two hours to write this little snippet of a dream. And when I finished writing it, uh, Tamara and Brenda came out to the church to pray. And when they came in, I, I, Brenda came in here and I asked Tamara, uh, or we were discussing something different and I said, well, look, let me share this dream with you because I got to get it off my chest. I got to tell somebody what this dream is. So I tell her and she just kind of looks at me like, oh, OK. <laughs> I was like, OK, it's a goofy dream. <laughs> That's all I needed. And I come in here to get some coffee and Brenda comes up and she asked me if I'd seen an interview. And I said, no, not yet. I tried to pull it up, but I didn't watch it. And she said, oh, by the way, I just got an interesting text. Let me pause there and give you my dream. In the dream, I'm out here at the church. I'm right over here in, uh, where the grass and the asphalt meet, and I'm just kind of walking around, and all of a sudden, a bunch of cars start pulling down the parking lot. And where, as a preacher, would normally get all excited because somebody's actually showing up, I did not feel the excitement. There was a solemn, heavy feel on me in this dream. It was not uh, daylight, but yet it was not dark. It was this dusk uh, uh, place, and, it, and the dream was, it, it was odd. Most things were, were real drab in color. And I began to look, and it, the parking lot filled up so much that there were cars lined up down the road on each side. Some of y'all are thinking, oh, this is revival. <laughs> And then people started getting out and coming over here to this area and circling up like they were waiting on some big announcement. And most of the people had this fear on their face. And, and there, wasn't, there, there was not a giddy feel. There was not a, a laughing. It was, it was a very solemn, serious, like there was about to be uh, uh, this announcement of what we have to do to survive kind of thing. So I'm watching all this, not really knowing what's going on. And then I see someone and they take out a pipe and begin to stuff it with marijuana. This is, not, this is part of my dream. I can't help it. <laughs> I get mad. And I look and, and Miss Sandy's standing beside me and I said, that better be tobacco. And she said, I don't think so. I overheard that person say, we're fixing to get lit. So I walk over 
And I take the pipe out of the girl's hand and I slam it on the ground. I said, what are you doing? And her boyfriend, husband, whatever the guy was, he bows up at me. So little man syndrome kicks in. I bow back up. And I said, what do you think you're doing? This is a church and you will respect this church. And they get all mad. And I said, if you want to get high, leave. And then they left. I actually remember seeing the car leave in the, in the dream. This is significant. Y'all looking at me like, how dare you? But this, there is a significant part in that. And then I look over to the side back here, and there is a hangar, like an airport hangar back here. And guys are walking in in plain clothes, and they're walking out in military camouflage. And I'm like, so I, I go down there. And I'm watching some of them. Some of them are just giddy, like they're going to a football game. Woo yeah, screaming and, and all this kind of stuff. And I'm looking at them like they're nuts. <laughs> and then there's other ones that are very serious and solemn. And when, they, when they're walking toward that hangar, they're just very formal, very business, head down, just focused on what they're doing, just serious. Not fearful, serious. So you, you see three groups that, that are appearing in this. You have a group over here that is confused, bewildered, and afraid. You have a group uh, uh, that is mixed in going out to this hangar. Part of them are very solemn and very serious, and the other part are just giddy and happy and think that something big is about to happen. So I go into the hangar, and I get my duffel bag, and I begin to load my camo and, I, uh, and, and extra magazines and grenades and all these uh, things that I would need. And then I go to walk out, and I remembered I didn't get my phone charger. Don't ask me. I'm still... I'm still processing the phone charger thing. I tell you that because it was very significant to me in the dream. So I know that there's a significance to it. So I go back in to get my phone charger. The rest of the dream, I am walking around and I'm, and I'm holding that phone charger like this. I've got the death grip on that phone charger. At one point, I went, where's my charger? So I get my stuff and I walk out. And I'm coming up and right over here on the sidewalk, there's a guy running up, a very uh, uh, robust man. And he's all excited and, and he's just, just giddy. He said, aren't you excited? This is great. This is what they said would happen. It's finally happening. It's finally coming true. Now is the time. Deep thought for a moment. I looked at him and I said, I'm nervous. And I go inside the church and we, we had apparently remodeled because the whole front of that was kind of gutted and it was larger and there was an office over there. And my mother, Bruce and Julia, and I really don't appreciate this from y'all three, are over there in the office and they're just talking and laughing and just having a good time. Well, I'm going through my duffel bag while I'm holding on to my charger looking to make sure, okay, I got my camo, I got, I got extra magazines, I got grenades, I got this, I got this, I got this. And they're just getting, my mother says, why are you afraid? I said, I'm not afraid, I'm nervous. And Bruce says, well, why are you nervous? It's just war. And I looked and I said, but this is a place where a lot of people don't come back from. And immediately I, I hear this, this plane come over the church like, like you would in a, in a war movie. And I see a glimpse of, of, of an image kind of like the beach of Normandy where all these guys are coming off the ships and they're, they're running on the beach. But there was no carnage. They were running on the beach victorious. They had taken the beach without the bloodshed. And then the dream flips and I'm in a, a, a transport bus. All of us are in military gear and, and we're, we're going. And everybody on my side of the bus is looking out those windows. There's a solemn feel. People aren't laughing and, and playing. I mean, everybody's serious because we are going now. It's real. And I look over and we pass a bridge like this one out here. And I see this creek and I see an alligator in the creek. And I said, there was a, a, a girl beside me and I said, did you see that alligator? And she said, no, what alligator? She's looking straight at it. And I said, I'm familiar with this area. There's a lot of alligators down there. And they're big. And then I wake up. So as you can tell, I really, <laughs> the whole way to the church, decided that this was not a prophetic dream. <laughs> too many details stuck with me too well. So then Brenda says, in the middle of this conversation, it's the oddest thing. I just got a text from a 16-year-old girl that had a, a strange dream last night. And I said, really? She said, yeah, we were about to go to war with three nations, and Trump was in the command center with his hand on the nuclear button about to nuke North Korea. I said, really? So we kind of laugh, and I share my dream. 
As soon as I said the word alligator, she starts, she actually reacted to the word alligator. Within a couple hours later, Sean calls my mother and he says, hey, we're at war. And coming from Sean with the information that he has, you don't know what that means. <laughs> I mean, that could mean that we just launched an attack. <laughs> so she says, what do you mean we're at war? He said, I sat down at my desk and I was praying and I was like, God, why are we always under attack? And the Lord spoke to me and said, you're not under attack, you're at war. Because when you are under attack, you get hit and you react defensively. But when you are at war, you go on the offensive taking ground. The Lord said, stop being under attack and start being at war. Within an hour of that conversation, my mother's watching the news and General Mad Dog Maddox is being taken into the command center because North Korea had just launched a missile. All this happened within a 10 hour span. That's a lot. So I've prayed and I've prayed and I've prayed about clarity from this. And, and let me give you one other dream that was shared with me a couple weeks ago. Jerry Grant visited the church a couple weeks ago. And he shared with me a dream that he had recently had where he was walking the property and praying. And then he sees my dad back uh, and, and kind of on a hill and he goes back to go toward him. And when he gets kind of close, my dad does like this, like, come here. And he's coming. And all of a sudden he sees this little ravine and there's a huge alligator in that ravine that won't let him cross. And my dad looked and said, come here, Jerry. And he said, I can't. There's an alligator. He says, don't worry about that alligator. The time is now. It's time. Come over. That's interesting. So now let me give you what, what I feel we're at and what I feel this, this, this means uh, because there's so many things happening prophetically in the body of Christ. And the body of Christ, the church, has seen revival after revival after revival, right? But we're on the brink of the greatest revival we've ever seen. Azusa Street was one of the greatest revivals the church has ever seen. And every denomination was birthed in revival. The, the, the Presbyterian, the Methodist, the Baptist, they're all birthed out of revival. And every time revival takes place, there is a spirit that seeks to shut down revival and her name is Jezebel. That is the spirit that has an assignment to stop the prophetic voice. Right? Take Azusa Street. Azusa Street was this great revival. Lasted for three and a half years. It began to wane after two ladies got upset at William J. Seymour. One of them had a crush on him, wanted to marry him. He didn't want to marry her. It's a bad deal. So they took almost all the records for the ministry and gave it, started another ministry elsewhere and began to compete. And then after that, it was just a downward spiral of what took place. John Kilpatrick, I was listening to him during the Bay Revival, and, and he said that he had a dream, and he, he described a woman that came and, and was trying to disrupt, and he said, I looked at that spirit and said, you're not doing this again. He was referring to Jezebel. So this, this Jezebel spirit has attacked the prophetic ministry and revival over and over and over. Well, if some of you remember a few years ago, I ministered on an anaconda where, where I showed the, 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 uh, the anaconda structure and the Jezebel spirit. I don't want to go back through that, but the reality is this. Anaconda is Leviathan. Leviathan is a spirit discussed in Scripture, and that is a parent structure of Jezebel. That is her covering. That is her source. So when Jezebel comes in and she gets beat up, where does she go? Back to her high place or back to her fortress, which is Leviathan. That is the spirit. So look at Job with me. See, I talk about warfare, and then I turn to Job. Is that not depressing? While you turn to Job, it's just before Psalm. While you turn to Job, let me uh, give you a couple things. In June of 2016, the, the Lord released the prophetic word that, the, that we were coming into an Elisha season. August 2016, the Lord released the word of 17, 17, 17. Victory, victory, victory. 
October 2016, the winds have shifted and the momentum is behind us. January 2017, windows of opportunity. August 2017, shackles and mantles. September 2017, Melania Trump will be an Esther to President Trump. The Lord is raising kingmakers. And then today, prepare for war. While you look at Job, let's, turn to, let's, let's hit chapter 3. We're going to go to chapter 41, but let's hit chapter 3 real quick. And while you find chapter 3, Ephesians 6.12 says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against authorities, against cosmic powers over this present darkness, over, against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. There is a hierarchical system in the demonic realm, just like there is in the angelic realm. There are angels and then there are archangels. There's a hierarchical system. And this Leviathan spirit is a territorial uh, uh, spirit that Jezebel operates under. So chapter 3 of Job says, After this, Job opened his mouth and he cursed the day of his birth. And Job said, Let the day perish on which I was born and the, and the night that said a man is conceived let that day be darkness may god above not seek it nor light shine upon it let gloom and deep darkness claim it let clouds dwell on it let the blackness of the day terrify it that night let the thickness of darkness seize it let it not rejoice among the days of the year let it not come into the number of the months behold let that night be barren let no joyful cry enter it let those who curse it curse the day who are ready to rouse up leviathan if you have a king james it says rouse up morning but that word morning is leviathan in the hebrew it says let those rouse up that spirit Leviathan. Now I find this odd. I'll give you one point right here. He says, let the day be turned to dark or let darkness uh, uh, terrify the day. In other words, let there be a solar eclipse. Just for a side note. I thought that was interesting. Let there be a solar eclipse on that day. But he says, let those rouse up that spirit of Leviathan. This is the first mention of Leviathan. It is a terrible spirit later on in... Um, I have to give you the verse in a minute. But it says that God strikes the fleeing serpent. Now look over in Job chapter 41. I'll read this to you and, and then I'm going to explain where I think we're at. Job chapter 41 says, Can you draw out Leviathan with a fish hook or press down his tongue with a cord? Can you put a rope in his nose <clears throat> or pierce his jaw with a hook? Will he make many pleas to you? Will he speak to you soft words? Will he make a covenant with you to take him for a, a servant forever? Will you play with him as you would with a bird or will you put him on a leash for your girls? Will traders bargain over him? Will they divide him up among the merchants? Can you fill his skin with harpoons and his head with fishing spears? Lay your hands on him. Remember this battle. You will not do it again. Behold, the hope of man is false. He is laid low even in the sight of him. No one is fierce, so fierce that he dares to stir him up. Who then is he who can stand before me? This is the Lord speaking. So by verse 10, he says, who is this that would stand before me? So go back in every verse, add the phrase, but I can. Because this is God speaking and verse 10 basically says, I can. So he says in verse 1, can you draw out Leviathan with a fish hook? I can. Or press down his tongue with a cord? I can. Can you pierce his rope with a nose? Because I can. Or pierce his jaw with a hook? Because I can. But who, will he make pleas to you? Because he will to me. Will he speak soft to you? Because he will to me. Will he make covenant with you to take, you for, uh, to take him as a servant? Because he will to me. Will you play with him as a bird? Because I can. Will you put him on a leash and let him play with your girls? Because I can. So who is it that would dare stand before me? The Lord the living God. That's pretty powerful, guys. There is no force on earth or in heaven or anywhere in between that could dare stand against the power of God. So he shows right there to Job in the midst of some of his darkest times. He says, don't you see, little man? 
That spirit that everybody is so afraid of, Leviathan was actually a mythical creature in that time that people talked about, but it was a, a, a spirit that the Lord was addressing here. He said, men will fear that. They would never intentionally stir that up because even the bravest of the brave are afraid of him. But I'm not. I'll put him on a leash and walk him around and listen to him beg to me. That's who I am. But the interesting part here in verse 2, when he says, would he put a hook in his jaw? Now, in Ezekiel 37, God says that he will put a hook in Magog's jaw and draw him down to the field of battle, right? What I feel is happening is God is putting a hook in Leviathan's jaw. There is a spiritual war about to take place. There may be a natural war, there may not be a natural war. But there's a spiritual war that we are on the brink of. We are entering into a final showdown with Jezebel. God is judging the spirit that has attacked his church. See, every revival up to this point has been stopped by that spirit. And God has allowed it for a season. But now he is enraged at that spirit because the move of God that is about to happen in America is the greatest move of God the church has ever seen. And he will not allow that spirit to stop it. So Jezebel, every time God begins to move in the church, guess who shows up? Jezebel does. I know her by name. I know her social security number. I know her birthday, and no, I don't send her a card on her birthday. Right? See, some people recognize Jezebel as, as a female in a short skirt and very uh, uh, promiscuously dressed, uh, seductive in that nature. Most of them don't come like that. Most of them come looking just like the great little church person that they pose to be. Most of them come and just, oh, bless God. I have a word to control you. I mean, I have a word for you, brother. They come in to stop what God is doing, to take over what God is doing so they can control the prophetic voice that is no longer prophetic but becomes pathetic and becomes demonic in nature. And they kill revival. They'll come into a church seeking power, seeking control. And the only way that the people that are in control can remain in control is if they submit to her control. And when they don't, when they are unsuccessful at one place, they will go to another and they will run a preacher off and they'll take their building. They will do anything they can to get what they want. And the ends justify the means because there's this deception on these people that operate in that spirit that say that I am God's favorite, so I am justified to do what I want to do. And they will actually get into the spirit realm and try to kill people. I've said that for years, and I've looked at people, uh, when I say that, and they'll, they'll get this glazed over look, like a deer caught in the headlights, they go, Whew. I was with you until that. <laughs> Sally Quinn, was, uh, it was uh, released in the news this week. See, this hurricane happened and God's been exposing the work of the enemy in the nation. Sally Quinn is called a gatekeeper of D.C. And she admitted this week to, getting, uh, to using the occult to put hexes on people to kill them. Now, why is it that we can believe people in the world will do that, but we don't believe that people in the world would infiltrate the church and do that? It's real. So here's what's happening. God is putting a hook in the jaw of Leviathan. And he is drawing that spirit to war. The same way that he drew Goliath into the valley for battle. Goliath wasn't brought to the valley of, 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 of war just to torment the army of Israel. 
God actually provoked him, put a hook in his jaw and brought him down there because it was a season to destroy the giant that had posed this threat against the army of Israel. He had four other brothers. So there's five of them that, that existed. But as long as there was a threat, nobody would stand against them. So all of a sudden, this five foot six little boy that's been out tending sheep comes up and says, hey, I'm here to fight you. And Goliath says, what am I, a dog? <laughs> and David so politely replies, if you say so. <laughs> and Goliath says, little boy, I'm going to chop your head off. And he says, no, sir. I'm going to kill you and I'm going to take your sword and I'm going to cut your head off. God puts a hook in the jaw of the enemy to bring them to a valley of war so he can empower his people to defeat the enemy and give them a complete victory. This is Hebrew year 5777777. Seven, it is a year of completeness. We are coming upon the Jewish New Year, which will happen in, in about a week. Is it a week? Is it, I don't know when the New Year is, like the 20th, 21st. That right there is a bringing to the close and to the completion of old cycles. This is why the word about shackles was so important. And that warfare that has existed within the churches. God is bringing a close to the reign of Jezebel. That's why that prophetic word that we were coming into an Elisha season is so important. Because we need to understand that Elijah fought against Jezebel. Ran from his life from Jezebel. When she seemed to be at the most powerful, he ran to the wilderness and said, God, I just wish you would take my life. And God says, get up, I've got something for you to do. I need you to anoint Elisha. I need you to anoint Haziel. I need you to anoint Jehu. Notice the intentional emphasis. If Jehu would have had a radio on his chariot, he would have came rolling into town with who let the dogs out playing on the radio. <laughs> whoop, whoop. We are in that season where we are going to see Jezebels in the world, natural Jezebels exposed and unthroned. And we are going to see them in the church exposed and unthroned. People that pray unrighteously will be uncovered and no longer will ministers come under the warfare ignorantly, but they will see it. A lot of them are going to have to acknowledge that it exists. Mark met with a pastor several years ago and their family was coming under a, a, a severe attack. And this is a godly man, a good man. And Mark looked at him and said, what you're dealing with is a witchcraft attack. And the gentleman said, oh, son, you don't understand. We don't fight those anymore. We've already got the victory. God's about to expose this. The teaching has been there for 30 years. The teaching on the Spirit began in the late 80s, and it has continually increased because God has been bringing an awareness, but He's allowed the church to fight against that Spirit. Now, war will, there will always be a spiritual battle until we are in heaven. And that's reality. But that spirit that stops revival, that spirit that tries to choke the prophetic, that spirit that tries to hijack the prophetic, God is exposing and dealing with that spirit. So we are coming into a season of war. So the Lord is saying, prepare for war. But it's different than being under attack. So we don't let fear come in. Let me describe that emotion I had in this dream. It was not one of fear. Now, there were three camps that existed. Those that were fearful, those that had no clue of what it meant, and those that understood the war and they were going into war. Now, this is a Gideon's army. Gideon's army... They were going up against 300,000. There were 33,000 that came out to Gideon. You can find this in Judges. 
And the Lord spoke to Gideon and said, tell everybody, uh, everyone who's afraid to go home. So he gets up and he makes this big announcement. Everybody who's scared, you can leave. 10,000 people leave. Encouraging. <laughs> and then he sends the rest of them down to drink of the water. And the Lord was showing him there are some that know war and there are some that don't know war. Send the ones that don't know, send them home. And keep the ones that are here for war. That's what I saw in my dream. I saw some that were so excited because they didn't understand warfare. They were young and they were naive in the reality of warfare. They didn't know how hard it is and the costs. Then there was a group over there that were not fitted for war. They were there for answers. They were scared. They were bewildered. And the dope pipe, that was compromise. That was compromise. Will you allow compromise in? You have to have compassion. But compassion can never move you to the place of accepting. I've, I've been praying about several people uh, recently not in the church and, and, and different ones. And I, I know their lifestyle. And, and, I, I, and I've, God has given me such a compassion for them. It's one of those things of, of like the Lord saying, you don't understand where, what they've been through. You don't understand why they are the way that they are. Right. Now that doesn't excuse the action, but it does motivate our heart to pray differently. You don't know what somebody else, the trials, the tribulations, the wars, the, the betrayals, the hurts, the, the, all of the things they've been through to make them what they are today. So instead of judging them and beating them over the head, we take them and we love them and say, what you're doing is not right. But you don't have to do this anymore. There's healing in his wings. See, that's that group right over there. I was filled with compassion for that group. But at the same time, I wouldn't allow the filth to stain what was there. So they had to make a choice. If you want your pipe, if you want your high, then leave. But if you want answers, stay. And then the other groups, they were running to prepare for war. But different from Gideon's army, what I saw was God was pairing these two groups together. That the seasoned warriors could train, could teach, and could guard the, 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 the young, excited warriors because there was a level of that excitement that was needed in the more experienced group that was worn down with the war. Sometimes when you have fought spiritual wars for long enough, you get tired of fighting. And you need some of that youthful energy that's excited to go to war. And that youthful energy has to be reined in with wisdom and experience. They need one another. This is the war that we're coming into. Will it have a natural manifestation? There's a good chance. But if y'all will stand this morning, I'll, I'll, I'll close with this. God is transitioning his church into the ecclesia, the body of Christ, this, this governing body where we are governing in the spirit. And in order to do so, God is having to cleanse his church, to consecrate his church. He's got to break the old cycles and the shackles of the things that have existed. And then he will release new mantles of authority on us. Revelation 12, 10 and 11 says, Then I heard a loud voice saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down who accuses them day and night before our God. And they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. 
for they love not their lives even unto death. That word word is spoken word, decree, declaration, prophetic word. It is the act of speaking a prophetic revelation. We overcome in this war by the blood of the Lamb and the word, the declaration of our testimony.